So if you have a a patient that presents to you, let's say they're late 40s or early 50s, and their blood pressure reliably is sitting in the kind of maybe mid 140s or, or 150, that that would be a conversation of perhaps they do medication plus lifestyle. But if they were someone that, let's say, was overweight, was smoking, was drinking a lot, was consuming a diet that had a lot of salt, and they were kind of very committed to making lifestyle changes in that instance, you could send them away and say, hey, okay, if you're willing to make kind of aggressive lifestyle changes, you might be able to get this in control without medications? In general, I wish I could say, I mean, that sounds real good, but in real life, it often isn't all that effective. So what I tell patients, if I happen to be the first one to take a crack at managing their blood pressure and they come in, like you said, 145 to 150, they're 40 years old, I'll tell them, look, you need to be treated. We're going to start both medication and lifestyle measures. Your BMI is 32. Your target BMI is 24. You're about 50 pounds overweight. You lose those 50 pounds, we'll revisit the meds. And weight is our biggest win when it comes to high blood pressure care because weight loss is probably the single most important factor from a lifestyle, non-drug standpoint to lower blood pressure. And so I put the, I put it out in that particular way. I'll reconsider the meds. And, you know, I've had a couple of patients that have lost the 50 to 60 pounds. They off, <laughs> almost always had an incentive. They wanted to get into a tux and look nice for the kid's wedding. Okay, that's one incentive to lose lots of weight and maybe you have eight months to do that. Or they've had oral surgery and their jaw has been wired shut. <laughs> you know, they can't eat. It's another time I've seen that kind of weight loss. And now with the things called the GLP-1 receptor agonists, the Zempics, the Wagovis, the Tides, his Tepratide, Semaglutide, and he's in clinics for this. That kind of weight loss has some blood pressure improvement associated with it. I'm not recommending that right on this because there's a whole discussion that has to take place for that, let alone how much it costs. But that aside, to answer your question, I do both. And I offer to, re, you know, to back off on the medication if they can do the lifestyle changes. But, you know, honestly, Simon, I'm kind of a Calvinist at heart. I believe that people are inherently not as good as they think they are. And consequently, even the most highly motivated person, I don't want to waste six months to a year waiting for their blood pressure to come down when it sits at 150 for a year. I just don't think that's a great idea. And coming back to what you said earlier, the at least your approach is aiming to get that person below 130, but you said the new guidelines and there might be some people out there that, that are suggesting that, well, it would it might be better to get them under 120 if they're someone that's high risk of cardiovascular disease. Yeah. So that's that's in the current guidelines. I won't say that it's, you know, on every page so that, you know, you when you really want to get a message across, you kind of insert it in multiple sections so that if you I mean the guidelines are a hundred pages long, right? Who sits down and reads a hundred page PDF, especially when it's single spaced in two columns. So, you know, if you're going to put something in there that you really think is important, you kind of put it in several sections, either under diagnosis, under management, under special circumstances, under really bad blood pressure control, that kind of thing. But when you look at the recommendations for doing the less than 120, my concern for that particular recommendation is it's based largely in studies, almost exclusively, in studies done in China. And that's fine. I mean, Chinese know how to do clinical trials and hypertension. I'm not this is not a criticism of an Asian population study where high blood pressure has been the target, 140 versus 120. What bothers me about it is, is that Asian, pure Asian, especially populations, have a different outcome profile for blood pressure elevation compared to the mixture of peoples that we have in the U.S., and stroke is a big one in China, especially. So stroke benefits are remarkable when you lower blood pressure. And that the stroke and the heart failure are the two biggest wins when it comes to treating high blood pressure and looking for improvement. The other problem, not the other, the other issue with the 120 with high cardiovascular risk is much of the three studies, one and a half, are diabetics. And so diabetics are a 
a population where we know the uh, risks are enhanced because you've got now another risk factor besides hypertension that collude with one another because diabetes and high blood pressure both attack the circulation through independent processes, but also because they're interlinked. If you're diabetic, you have twice the likelihood of hypertension. If you're hypertensive, you get twice the likelihood of developing diabetes. So when you have partners in crime like that, it's a different issue than just you know, generic hypertension alone. So when you base recommendations on that kind of uh, epidemiology, even though it's clinical trial data not done in the U.S., I've got an issue with the feasibility of getting to those levels because the Chinese look a little more drug sensitive to me. We usually need three or more drugs to get below 120 in the U.S., but the Chinese can do it with one and a half to two drugs. You know, one and a half, uh, that's an average, so some are on one, some are on two. But the sensitivity of the Chinese populations to blood pressure medicine looks a little bit more that they are more amenable to blood pressure reduction with the pharmacology available. They're the same drugs we have. They just seem to respond a little bit better than we do in the U.S. Because, you know, is a black American the same as a Chinese American, the same as a Hispanic American, the same as a white American, in terms of the likelihood of not only blood pressure reduction, but benefit from blood pressure reduction. So we have populations of risk that are at higher risk. You take a black American and a white American, same age, same gender, and you lower the blood pressure on both, you're going to get more benefit in general in the white compared to the black American because they are inherently at greater risk. So the sub ethos, ethnos that are present in our population are different in terms of outcomes. And that's why I just am a little concerned about forced you know, about, about reaching a 120 millimeter systolic blood pressure goal when your prevent risk is more than seven and a half percent in the coming decade. The reason I asked that question was I'm sure there are many people listening to the show that are having this conversation with their doctor. And what I'm taking away is that would you would you agree, would it be the case that most physicians, at least in the United States, if they're dealing with someone who has uh, blood pressure of 150, 160, they would be having a conversation with that patient that what they're trying to do is, is, is at least initially get them below 130? Is that the kind yes. of the shared goal? Right, right. Getting below 130 is step one. Getting below 120 is an option that I think you can exercise. If you get if you get them down to 126 to 130 on maybe two drugs and they feel okay. I mean, hardly anybody's going to feel great taking two medications for blood pressure, but you know, maybe you can lucky one or two people will do. That said, if you think you can reasonably lower it, the extra six to eight points to get them to 118, 116 without causing them to be excessively dizzy, without nausea, without falling asleep in the middle of the afternoon, and a number of the other things that patients over the years have told me about. I know the drugs are helping, but I have this concern about them. So if you think you can add or titrate give a little bit more of something to get them a little further down the systolic line to less than 120, and they have high cardiovascular risk, that's the population that I think you're going to get the biggest likelihood of not only achieving that, but keeping them on it. Our biggest, at least to me, the biggest challenge we have in high blood pressure care is not that we don't have enough medications or ideas about lifestyle for it to work. Our biggest challenge is keeping people doing it keeping them on their meds, keeping their weight down, keeping the exercise at how many minutes a week, whatever it is. You know, when you first do that, it's like, okay, I'll do it. But it, you know, after a year or two, it gets a little more challenging to stay the course. And that's where the cheerleading aspect of blood pressure care comes into play. I recently ran my full labs through Function Health. And I have to say the results were eye-opening. Turns out my ApoB was higher than ideal, probably thanks to a little too much coconut yogurt. I also found out I was slightly low in copper, something that I would have never suspected without testing. On the flip side, my biological age came back 13.3 years younger than my actual age, a calculation based on the work of aging researcher, Dr. Morgan Levine. So all in all, I've got a few tweaks to make 
make to optimize my lipids and nutrient status. But overall, my blood work says I'm doing pretty well. That's what I love about function. You get access to over 160 biomarkers covering everything from hormones and inflammation to nutrients, toxins, cardiovascular risk, and more. And all your results are housed in one beautiful platform, all tracked over time. Once you get your results, you can make informed changes before small issues become big ones. To get started, head to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill. The first 1000 people get a $100 credit toward their membership. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.